Ahora, pues, ¿dónde vas a estar sentado? Voy a ir. Pero eso no se te enfoca no tanto. Me voy a poner tres niños. Ah, ¿en qué lado? ¿En frente o qué? Sí, además. Okay, so um, we're going to start. Welcome to our second part of our uh, inter-university workshop on political metaphorology, a cooperation between the University of Innsbruck and the Emerita Universidad Autónoma de Puebla. Um, we're going to hear three uh, talks today um, and have a common discussion of the three talks afterwards. So I would say we jump right in uh, with Saida Olvera and a paper titled Blumenberg, Absolute Metaphors and the Biologization of Political Discourse. Thank you. Um, I, will, I was supposed to speak freely, but I suddenly wrote a project. And I'm going to to read some uh, parts of it. Uh, as we said yesterday at the beginning of our of our workshop, uh, I took very seriously the idea that this was going to be a presentation of a work in progress. So this is uh, clearly um, work in progress. So it's just just my it's, just my project, and then um, I analyze some main ideas that I'm interested in um, concerning human beings uh, metaphorology. So I'm going to to explain to you. Um, I'm going to project the project, the part of the text. Um, Tell me if you can see it, please. Can you read it? <laughs> can, you, can you see it? Okay. So uh, this project is part of a larger investigation called Organic Metaphors in Political Philosophy and Political Discourse in 19th and 20th century, in which I analyze the metaphorical use of four bi biological concepts, organism, sickness, assimilation, and evolution in selected philosophical and political texts. Uh, I'm going to skip some parts. Um, I'm going to talk to you today um, about A, the discussion on the epistemic value uh, of biological metaphors in political philosophy that, and, and political thought, and C, a case study, biological metaphors in the construction of a nation-building project in Mexico before and after the Mexican Revolution. So, and these are going to be my, my subjects, evolution and race. Um, so the state of art. Um, yeah, I, I read that. There, state of art. 
So in the article, The Influence of Darwinism Upon Racial Concept in Mexico, concepts, sorry, Juarez and Bueno, clearly synthesized a problem concerning the investigation of racial discourse in Mexico. They state that, I quote, although the influence of evolutionary ideas upon racial concepts in Mexico has been pointed out by this researchers, a precise analysis of exactly which Darwinian ideas were taken in order to build the new national project is still lacking, as well as an analysis of the original context in which these ideas were produced and how they were reinterpreted once transformed to the social domain, end of quote. Although this verdict seems slightly draconian, this diagnosis is to some extent accurate. Rosaura Brice, one of the leading voices in the field, stresses that a critical research domain concerning Darwin's influence in the political domain of the pre and post revolutionary context already exists. Ruiz cites the work of several researchers, such as Fernanda Suela, Ricardo Noguera, Ana Barahona, and Susana Esparza. All these authors are biologists. Noguera and Sparza appears to be more interested in the social consequences of the use and abuse of biological Darwinian metaphors. For example, Sparza has a detailed analysis of the discussions between defenders of the idea of evolution in a conservative sense, as defenders of the idea of survival of the fittest, and the defenders of the idea of evolution and therefore of revolution in the press. It is true that there is a considerable interest, interest in Darwin's presence in Mexico, but a specific field concerning the ideological use of biological hypotheses seems to be lacking. This, of course, does not mean that there are not texts of this sort. Some exceptions are Laura Suarez y López Guazos' groundbreaking dissertation, Eugenesia y Racismo en México, and several articles addressing the problem of racism from the perspective of the interplay between scientific or medical discourse and the social and political sphere. The flourishing of these investigations coincides with the emergence of Zapatista movement in 1999. But as a very important study of Monica Moreno Figueroa shows, the production of this text is far from being a priority in academia. Now, undoubtedly, a general approach is also important to establish general research guidelines. Rosaura Ruiz has provided interesting insights on the possible connections between important figures of the political world during the dictatorial regime, Carina Barreda, Augusto Sierra, and Darwinism. Uh, through the book of Ernst Heckels and Herbert Spencer's. She has also pointed, uh, pointed that Heckels mixture of Darwinism and Lamarckism built the scientific ground for Justo, Sierra, for Justo Sierra's program of educational policy during the regime of Porfirio Diaz. This is an important consideration since it highlights the conflicts between the determinism hypothesis and the influence of the milieu uh, hypothesis. Nevertheless, she doesn't she does not explain exactly what Hagel's explanation of the problem was, nor why this was a major concern for Sierra. Concerning the importance of a metaphorical relocation from the biological to the social and political domains, Juarez and Bueno, and bueno recognizes the rhetorical, the rhetorical use of Darwin's ideas to construct the image of the mestizo. However, they state that Darwin's ideas were used only rhetorically. From this, they conclude that this loan is an innocuous strategy proper to amateurs of science. This approach seems to me weak and dubious, for it does not only neglect the epistemological value of metaphors, but also obscures the problematic context in which these metaphors were appearing, not to mention that they do not consider the causes and consequences of this rhetorical use. The main problem with Juarez and Bueno's paper appears when they suggest that racism was seized in Mexico due to the influence of August Comte and his belief in racial equality. 
This statement must be taken cum gramisalis. Although they analyze the non-biological ideas of race in Comte's positivism, they seem to deliberately ignore the existence of racial policy in Mexico. The policies against Yaquis in northern Mexico during the years just before the revolution and the constant aspiration for Europeanization of the populist elites show that a negative appreciation of endemic cultures and population played an active role. Justo Sierra is part of this world and a very influential voice. He is the founder of the National University, but he is also a voice claiming that education is a way to achieve homogeneity in the population. In the Mexican context, this means the disappearance of indigenous cultures. In the search for homogenization lies a negative valorization of indigenous languages and cultural practice. The last quotation is also symptomatic of one aspect of the research concerning rational policies in Mexico, a certain charitable attitude towards the leading cultural figures of modern Mexico. While it is true that there are a lot of studies concerning Darwin's presence in Mexico, a clear and self-assumed specific field concerning the ideological use of some biological hypothesis seems again to be lacking. I draw upon Moreno's study where she states, I quote, on average, we have published 1.1 articles concerning racism per year since 1956 in Mexico. These numerical exercises limited to journals tell us something about the relevance that this subject has in our country. End of quote. This statement refers not only to papers dealing with the discourse laws between biology and politics during the very important period of pre and post revolutionary Mexico, but to the diverse approaches to the problem of racism in Mexico. This indicates that the average production of texts dealing with the subject I am interested in is even more scarce. Although it is clear that the historians of the reception of biological ideas in Mexico, most of them biologists, as I said before, have lucidly referred to the constant transfer at the foreign, between the biological and the social fields, and although they make use of some important hypotheses of, for example, the sociology of life science, and even the metaphoro uh, metaphorological approach I draw upon as well, Blumenberg, the general tone of this research lacks a racial perspective. They also lack more detailed research into what they constantly refer to as the common ideas of that time. One very important work on this subject is that of Susana Esparza in collaboration with Rosaura Ruiz. The work of Susana Esparza has an important value for my own research. Her article deals with the metaphor evolution of evolution in Mexican political thought during the period I am interested as well. But while she draws upon Blumenberg's metaphorology, her text focuses almost exclusively on the narration of the confrontations, confrontation between two major political sides, the conservatives and the liberals. The problem I perceive in her approach is the same as that revealed by Juarez and Bueno. Although she clearly explains what evolution meant for Sierra and Molina Enriquez, for example, there is no textual analysis of the discussion that these Mexican intellectuals were having or referring to in their use of the word evolution. We don't get to see the discursive universe where this concept acquires some of its most conspicuous semantic determination. In short, there is no discussion at Intram of how Mexican intellectuals reappropriate the scientific concepts and metaphorize them, since we don't get to see what is on the other discursive sphere. I claim that it is important to render visible the process of semantic transformations of concepts in the history of science. It is important to show how scientific concepts are applied in the political domain, but it is not enough to present concepts as already functioning in political discussions. It is also of great value to get the whole picture from within and to understand how both domains, the biological and the political, were interacting. 
So that's my project. Uh, now I'm going to present some ideas I took from Blumenberg. I think, as I said before, uh, even if um, Rosaura Ruiz, for example, takes Blumenberg's concept of metaphorology, I think she's not, um, she uses it just as a, as a name, uh, but she's not making the metaphorical analysis Blumenberg is suggesting as a method. So the next uh, part of my presentation is um, some uh, reflections on what can be considered the metaphorolog metaphorology as a method. What is going to in PowerPoint? So this is this is still um, no los perdimos, no. This is, as I said before, um, a project. I haven't developed what I present here. So remember the role of metaphors in political thought. How uh, metaphorology can help us to understand the case of biological metaphors in pre-revolutionary social thought in Mexico. So uh, Blumenberg is um, giving an epistemological status of two metaphors. And this is what I um, appreciate the most uh, in his thought. The next two? Yeah. So Blumenberg has taken seriously Kant's suggestion that philosophy needs a new branch of study, namely the symbolic thought. According to Kant, this is a source of a special knowledge but he does not define, define it, not provide any other sort of specification. Blumenberg's project consists in searching for paradigms, paradigms of absolute metaphors. Relatedly, uh, relatively long periods of time in which an image acquires a particular meaning. What is an absolute metaphor? An image that just is conceptualization. His project, as is well known, can be considered a sort of archaeology of the underwater world of images that grounds the world of concepts. Who says Levin did? A metaphorology is a philosophical task to approach the substructure of thought. In which sense, metaphorology is not a method. Uh, it's not a method in the sense of uh, being able to prescribe. Uh, metaphors cannot be prescribed, you cannot um, tell a society to use an image in order to understand something that escapes uh, conceptuality, so to say. Therefore, uh, he can be considered as an opponent uh, of what Schelling called new mythology. You cannot demand a new mythology in society because myths and metaphors are the substrate, actually, of our conceptual world, according to himself. In which sense, metaphorology, it is a method. So I took a lot of um, uh, in paradigms, paradigms to uh, metaphorology. I took a lot of um, methodological um, claims, and I am making like a, um, like a resume of this of these ideas. So metaphor value, the, the value of truth of metaphor is not theoretical, but practical. This is very important uh, for me. They determine behaviors and attitudes. Metaphors in metaphorology are not treated as strange elements, in semantic space, in the semantic space. They are analyzed historically. From this perspective, they are rather bad semantical spaces in which concepts are, and in which, and in which comes, uh, they acquire, sorry, their particular semantic determinations. I consider they can be seen as imaginary a priori. A priority does not imply 
isolated genes. They are affect us for our experience. Therefore, the importance of the um, idea, Husserl's idea of lemon set. Metaphors fill the vacuum of abstraction of concepts. They are tools that help us to intuit borders. Metaphorology demands a function-oriented interpretation of all these moments. So are there political metaphors? Blumenberg does not refer to political metaphors. Blumenberg does not even talk about the political use of metaphors, but he talks about praxis. Metaphors build attitudes. They have pragmatic functions. Think of the example of infinity. Um, infinity, like in Pascal, uh, determine Pascal's attitude towards life, for example. Um, there is explicit reference to the practical force, to a sort of politics of metaphors. So the, uh, this is my last slide, how to deal with the biological metaphor in Mexican political discourse and in, sorry, in pre and post-revolutionary Mexico. This is some, I, I'm dropping some idea uh, that I haven't developed yet. So I want to, to see what you think. Following Blumenberg's method, I will analyze the metaphor of evolution related to population policies, education and health. Evolution as a metaphor of the future is a violent image because it implies the disappearing of the indigenous populations, not to mention that it erased completely the difference among the hundreds of indigenous peoples in Mexican territory. While this might seem obvious, it is not obvious how this image pervades particular policies, such as the standardization of language in the educational system, drug prohibition, or birth control. As said before, there is an alarming lack of studies concerning the actual use and practice of these metaphors in political Mexican uh, Mexican political life. So this is my yeah I'm I'm done. <laughs> Thank you for. <laughs> okay, can you maybe show the. Participants again. Because now I'm talking into the void. <laughs> yeah. Tal vez en la pantalla, ¿no? En la compu. Okay, there we are again. So let's continue with Rainer Stummer's talk. Rainer, are you ready? Um, we will hear the talk Stein und Zeit, the geological metaphor in the post foundational imaginary. The floor is yours, Rainer. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we hear you. Cool. So, um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie, for the invitation uh, and this opportunity, you know, to uh, present so far away from home. Um, and I also took the understanding of this being a work in progress kind of thing uh, rather seriously. And I'm trying to offer, you know, a metaphorical glimpse into my workshop since I am currently in the process of molding this argument. And... Um, before I start, I'd like to declare like the direction I'm arguing from. And I'm interested in a post-foundational perspective on matter, meaning a um, desubstantialization of matter, weakening its solidity of solidity, that is, its political capacity for determination, which I believe necessary and urgent uh, in uh, the face of uh, climate emergency. The material origin of my argument is an engagement with concrete, the mundane building material that is said to be the material of modernity and paradoxically is characterized as liquid stone. Uh, it is this aporia between a liquid and a solid counterpart, which we can repeatedly encounter in post-foundational political thought, namely 
on the level of metaphor. Uh, now to start, as uh, Sergei Seitz and Gerald Fossil wrote, the use of metaphors within epistemic discourses always begs the question whether these metaphors can be controlled in full or if they tend to undermine the discourse's self-conception and claim of validity. So when I set out to analyze the capacity for insights gained by the use of these geological metaphors, meaning the analogous use of geological terms such as lava, magma, sediment, stone, or concrete for social phenomena, such as language, power, or change and changeability, I would like to point out a critical remark sites and possible to make in reference to Max Black, namely that the, that the direction of the metaphors goes, goes both ways. If the denotation as stone sheds a certain light on the social, so does stone appear more social than before. In uh, the recent years, this relation has received increasing attention, especially from the so-called new materialisms, but in a mostly non-metaphorical way. For example, when Jane Bennett sought after a literal vibrancy or liveliness of matter on her way to a sustainable monism in which everything is ontologically one, but formally different. Despite the notable exception of Donna Haraway, who contended metaphors contain the gem of contain the germ, sorry, the germ of concrete expect expectations and give definite limits to acceptable theoretical accounts in science, a practical notion of metaphor embedded in situated knowledge I find quite useful. New materialist impulse might highlight a pressing need to conceptualize human nature relations anew but usually does so with a rather ethical direction that has little political potential. When, <clears throat> when Jane Bennett reads uh, Jacques Rancière and his use of the metaphor of eruption as the statement that the political is like a force of nature, she quickly casts the force of the metaphor, its explanatory power and its limits aside and asks the other way around whether an animal, a plant or a drug or a non-linguistic sound could possess that very political force. The like disappears and the force of nature directly becomes a political force called thing power or geo power. However, even if accepting this power to be a factor in the social, it does not immediately follow to accept it as in and of itself political. Now, instead of contending the geological directly possesses and exerts a political power, which needs to be taken into account, I would like to propose to have a closer look at the explanatory power of the geological metaphor within political theory. Um, my hypothesis here is this, uh, since contemporarily we witness not the nature of power that changes, but the nature of nature, that is to say, the geological, the inert, has become unstable and somewhat awake and now under influences and now influences the workings of our nature infused metaphors and gives us an opportunity to ponder their employment and to reevaluate their effect. Now, what do I mean uh, when I say the nature of nature? Uh, similarly to when I earlier referred to matters solidity of solidity, this pairing indicates the idea that we cannot directly access the being of nature. Instead, whatever concept of nature we might arrive at will always be mediated, be mediated by theory, and theory always will be marbled by politics. Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe, to whose metaphorical use of the geological I will turn in a second, describe nature as something that doesn't lend itself to a self-evident reading of its appearance, but as a snapshot of an historically contingent social construction. And coincidentally, when explaining their position, they use the example of stone. To quote, to call something a natural object is a way of conceiving it that depends on a class classificatory system. This does not put into question the fact that this entity, which we call stone, exists in the sense of being present here and now, independently of my will. Nevertheless, the fact of its being a stone depends on a way of classifying objects that is historical and contingent. If there were no human beings on Earth, 
those objects that we call stones would be there nonetheless, but they would not be stones because there would be neither mineral mineralogy nor language capable of classifying them and distinguishing them from other objects, end quote. So um, to reiterate my hypothesis, some things might exist on their own, but their being is neither fully accessible to us just by existing next to them, nor does their meaning remain undistorted by the way we perceive them and talk about them. And of course, if the way we talk about them is subject to change, so changes the limits of acceptability, the claim of validity, and the explanatory power of the scientific accounts they are metaphorical counterparts to. But even if we cannot fully know the being of the geological, we can certainly detect a shift in its relation to society, a relation that has been stable and now increasingly becomes shaky after having overstepped some boundaries, causing us to experience what the sociologist and close co-worker of uh, Bruno Latour, Nikolai Schulz, called land sickness, a simultaneity of social and material uncertainty pointing toward the necessity to rethink the geological from a certain point of view. Considering Laclau's and Mouffe's notion that nothing follows from the existence of an object, we need to ask, how do we evoke political consequences of such changes? This can be approached with a post-foundational political thinking. So I've already entered a post-foundational political theory that in some important parts employs the geological metaphor. Um, Post-foundational thought, to use Oliver Marquardt's characterization, basically comprises of two things. One, its refusal of foundationalism, such as last and first principles and ultimate grounds or certainties. And two, the necessity of struggling for penultimate grounds or partial and temporal foundations. Now, describing the moment of either settling or unsettling, grounding or ungrounding such a foundation is precisely where in, the, in Ernesto Laclau's work, the geological metaphor appears. It appears as sediment, a concept which functions as a hinge between the social and the political. Sedimentation in geology describes the process of accretion or settlement of loose, small-grained mineral or organic matter, which, after a passage of freely floating in a flowing medium, such as air or water, due to gravity, sinks down and slowly becomes a rather hard layer on the ground in the place of its floating. So how does the geological imagery ingress into the sphere of the social and as an accretion of passive matter stand opposite to the dispersed, lively eventfulness of the political. Laclau, as he explains in his less read New Reflections, draws on Edmond Fussel's differentiation between sedimentation and reactivation, with which he obtains a criterion for the analysis of social entities as well as theoretical concepts, which entail the forgetting or even concealing the acts of their original institution. While uh, during the event of its primordial institution, the contingency of any foundation was visible through the routinizing effect of repetition, this contingency fades and sediments turns to stone. Laclau writes, insofar as an act of institution has been successful, a forgetting of the origins tends to occur. The system of possible alternatives tends to vanish and to vanish and the traces of the original contingency to fade. In this way, the instituted tends to assume the form of a mere objective presence. This is the moment of sedimentation. What we can see here is a function of the geological metaphor that highlights the passivizing disconnection of a mere presence, a nowism in temporal terms, for the political dimension, dimension of power. A disconnection that is attempted but never fully achieved and always stays open to reactivation. So what we see here is that after having done away with transcendental fixation of meaning, the possibility of reaching ultimate ground, the remaining option of the temporal foundation entails in the geometaphorical language employed by Laclau, a becoming discursive of the geological, which henceforth, henceforth shows the traces of contingency penetrating it. 
Uh, with this in mind, I would now like to argue that by virtue of the mode of operation of metaphor, I already established the fact that it works both ways, we perform what Laclau would have called a classically constructed move. The social and the geological, one taking the place of the other in the moment of the metaphor, are rendered undecidable, and the two poles become contaminated by that undecidability. And bearing in mind that the social for Laclau is the ossified political, we are allowed to understand the political as potentially geological, just as we are allowed to imagine the geological as potentially political. Um, an example for this, uh, this uh, of course, again, refers to the inaccessibility of uh, the true being of things, which prevents us from fixating their meaning once and for all. And Oliver Macher takes up Laclau's and Mouffe's argument and exemplifies it with the eruption of a volcano. A uh, volcanic eruption, he writes, could very well be socially constructed and understood as a natural phenomenon or as wrath of God. In any case, a whole network of power relations comprising of scientific or religious discourses, for example, needs to be in place in order to support each of those understandings. And of course, the installation of such a network is entirely political. This became increasingly clear since the publication of the so-called hockey stick graph in 1998 by Michael Mann and has manifested in the field of attribution science, which is dedicated to attribute natural phenomena to social factors and thereby not only support the ontologization of nature, but also political struggles for climate justice. Now, with Laclau's notion of the sediment, we can concede to the fact that being finite, humans cannot give to their principles a metaphysical necessity that they do not have in their own being. Yet, we must not miss the fact that discursive practices may entail the use of material, may materialize into institutions of all kinds, into built infrastructure or into its displacement and lasting absence. Such materialized practices can easily outlast a human lifespan and unfold a weak transcendence, which is not to be understood as Reinhard Koselleck writes, in the sense of otherworldly, otherworldliness, but in the sense that they reach beyond and undergird multiple generations. Here, Koselleck touches upon something Laclau doesn't engage in. Uh, historical times, he suggests, are grounded in biological finitudes. So while finitude strips humans of, humans of any metaphysical principle, the command over matter enables them to endow some of their work with a geological temporality that, if itself not conceptualized, contaminated by the social, may appear certain or as an ultimate ground. Therefore, to give nuance to Laclau's metaphor of the sediment and be mindful of its blind spot, I suggest employing Koselleck's theory of the sediments of time that refers to sediments as layered, geological foundations that differ in age and depth and that change and set themselves apart from each other at differing speeds over the course of the so-called history of the earth. This would, would give us the, and I quote Koselleck, ability to measure different velocities, accelerations and decelerations, and to thereby reveal different modes of historical change that indicate great temporal complexity. So uh, regarding the two counterparts in the title of my essay, I think we need to be mindful of both sediment as time stone, indicating the social having actively and politically been given a certain form as well, as stone time reminding us that not even stone and the things carved in it should be granted to, and um, to quote Jane Bennett, proceed at a speed or level below the threshold of human discernment. A theory of the reactivation of a sediment such as Laclau's surely equips us with the capacity to, to defend against transcendental ultimate grounds and somniferous political ideologies, creating awareness for a fixation of identities, objects, and meaning that may well outlive generations, but will ultimately remain subject to revision by a coming political force. However, bearing in mind what I mentioned earlier, that a metaphor goes both ways and makes the geological appear more social than before, I contend that such a theory will only reach the full extent of its effect 
when it is extended into the realm of the metaphorical counterpart, the geological rendering it fully political and ontologizable. The rereading of the post foundational classics with a focus on their metaphorical weaving in of the geological enables us to meaningfully apply post foundational thinking during a time in which shifting grounds have gone from metaphor to reality and in which the Lefourian dissolution of the markers of certainty has spread to the geological. In fact, it seems the post foundational reading of the geological is the apt reaction to the geological having become uncertain. And this requires post-foundationalism be read against the non-social material it has long neglected. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rainer. So I have uh, news from Lauren. He told me 10 minutes ago that he would be here in 10 minutes. But uh, I would say to give him a little bit more time to breathe, we could um right now program some 20 minutes of discussion of okay. both of your talks and then we will do Lauren, we will hear Lauren's talk and discuss it separately. Would that be okay for you? Yes. Okay. So we have now time for questions, remarks, comments. Also from the Zoom, whoever wants to stand up. Okay. Well, uh, my, my question is for Saida, since I could hear your contribution complete and very well, <laughs> even though I wasn't here. Uh, so my question is about the link between uh, metaphorology and, and ideology, because um, in these uh, interpretations of the evolutionary theory in the, in the political field, I couldn't help but think that uh, maybe we can we can think about to different uses of, of, of the metaphors in, in the political field. field. Uh, one uh, um, ideological use is because every every metaphor points out uh, some aspects in common between two different things and, and, and different aspects. I think that maybe the a conservative way of reading the metaphor it emphasizes only which is common. For example, in this relation between uh, evolution and the human society, we, we we can, from a conservative approach, say that uh, we are exactly the same as animals and, and the same laws that apply to the biological field, they are the same for the, for the political field. Ignoring the the differences between both, both fields. And maybe a critical approach or a critical uh, lecture of the metaphorology could emphasize the, 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 the difference. Yeah. So, so my general question is, is that, uh, do you see a relation between, uh, how to think uh, a relation between metaphorology and the critical of ideology? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I would maybe start by stating that as I take it, metaphorology does not help us to see how, uh, in this case, a political party bred a metaphor, but rather how they apply a metaphor. This is what I'm interested in. Uh, the practical uh, derives or the practical uh, dimension of metaphors. And that's what they, it renders them political, I think. This is, this is a way of um, stating that metaphors are political because they have practical consequences. Mm -hmm. So this is what I'm interested in, to see how they, uh, uh, a political party or people in general or a philosophy or um, a political discourse applies a metaphor. And maybe 
this is the main point where I can shift to your other question uh, concerning ideology. Um, I think it go it goes together, so to say. So the the application of a metaphor is also it's not only in policies or in institutions; it's also in discourses and political sense. So. Um, Metaphorology help as I take it, it can help us in, in the case I'm studying to um, analyze how this uh, metaphors of evolution and nature and all this Darwinian or pseudo Darwinian or Darwinian and Lamarckian uh, theories build um, a, a discourse, an ideology on race. But that's like half of it, because there's also the application. You can also say that ideology is um, embedded or um, it has body within policies. And I, in that case, I would uh, agree with you. But not my, my point is to say that they are not uh, separated. Mm -hmm. So ideology is already embedded in political mm -hmm. practice, mm -hmm. in laws, in institutions. Yeah. So there is no this difference, like in Althusser, for example, between infrastructure and superstructure. As far as I know, as far as I can see, take change. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as far as I can see in the case I'm studying, I think it's there's no uh, difference. When we analyze uh, infrastructure from the point of view of incarnated metaphors, you know, there are not uh, metaphors on this side and institutions on this side. That's how I, how I see it. And this has to do with Blumenberg's um, um, reprisal of Husserl's Levinson concept. So it is important to understand how this influenced the meaning of metaphor and metaphorology for, for Blumenberg. So metaphors are like inside um, or social work. They are not something in uh, national kind, an imaginary word, they are, they are existing metaphors, so to say. Mm -hmm. In this sense, there's no um, such uh, uh, an ontological difference between infrastructure and substructure or uh, ideology. It's not something just in the discourse or in, it's applied, it's uh, embedded and it's uh, institutional. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would have a, a follow up on that and then also the question to Raina. But uh, let's start with Ms. Slider because it's, um, I think it, it combines quite well. First of all, I wanted to, I mean, I guess also the, the people who are listening from Austria maybe are not uh, very familiar yeah. with the you know, educational reforms of Justo uh, Sierra. Yeah. And I'm only uh, very superficially familiar with that. So in my um, very general knowledge. Um, I can uh, categorize this, these reforms as liberal, liberal reforms. Yeah. Um, and okay, if we if we understand the, met the metaphors as built into the institution in this case uh, of the educational uh, system, I would like to hear from you a little bit more, like in what these uh, policies consisted and in what way this evolutionary metaphor might uh, be built into the these institutions. And then you also said that you are not um, embracing this dichotomy between liberalism and conservatism. So I, I would also like to hear more about why you are not, um, why for you it's not enough to talk about about okay, this okay. Um, about this difference. And um, maybe the last uh, sub um, question is. It's connected to this because if, if we conceive it um, as liberal reforms, and we have in mind that li liberalism, I think, is an, uh, a type of thought that is built on a, on the idea of progress. 
So I would like to hear what specific progress the evolutionary metaphor contains. Like if there is, like if you conceive of other um, metaphors that can relate to uh, and the idea of uh, progress of humanity that are not evolutionary. Um, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So maybe let's start with this last question. There are a lot of ways of conceiving progress without implying the biological idea of evolution. So evolution is a very tricky word because it has been used to translate um, a lot of concepts that do not relate to um, Darwin's idea. Even the way we use evolution, uh, and we even if we think that we are talking about uh, evolution in Darwinian sense, we are mostly not doing it because um, evolution in, in Darwin, it's not only a question of time, it's also a question of change. And change is not progressive for Darwin. It's um, horizontal, so to say, by by ratios can occur in in the, at the same time in the same epoch. It's not a, it's not um, necessary to consider it in a, a sequential time. That's a, a big difference. Um, for example, so Darwin is that, and that's uh, Darwinian concept of evolution. Evolution in um, in Wicklung in Hegel's philosophy does not imply Darwinian idea or the post-Darwinian reinterpretations of Darwin. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of um, concepts that could be uh, put together in the same bundle and be considered as uh, defined as evolutionary thought, but we have to be careful because evolutionary thought, since Darwin implies variation uh, and other kinds of times. For example, that, that Rainer was talking about geology, geology, sorry. Uh, it, uh, Darwin, Darwin's interpretation of evolution take for the first time into account deep time, so the time of Earth, because he was also very influenced by uh, Lyle and evolution, um, geological thought. So there are a lot of um, concepts of evolution, but not every concept of evolution implies the same um, sequential time. In the case of the discussion in Mexico pre um, most of all, pre-revolutionary discussion, uh, the concept of evolution was understood in a non-Darwinian way. Although uh, Justo Sierra and uh, company uh, would thought that they were taking Darwin's um, concept, they were thinking more in the sense of um, Spencer's. Uh, um, ideas on um, a moral change, not only a natural change, but also a moral sense, a moral change. So evolution was also considered as moral progress, and that's not Darwin. Um, so although they were thinking about Darwin, they were not reading Darwin, and they were not discussing, actually, and they were not taking up Darwin's uh, uh, concept of, of evolution. They were mixing very, um, in a very tricky way, uh, ideas that suited, suited their uh, political interests as well. So this... Um, Movements of translation are also, um, they are not clear and automatic. It's not just a transposition between that into another political or discourse. There are intentions as well. Um, so yes, to answer to the, to the last questions, to the last question, I would say that 
um, related to conservatives and liberals, I was just I was just saying that I don't think it is enough to analyze in a metaphor metaphorological way the discussion between liberals and conservat conservatives, which is what Rosaura Ruiz does. I think it's not enough. If this is just uh, a discussion in journals, it's important. But if we want to analyze this uh, uh, epoch in a metaphorological way, as they themselves state, I think that's that it's not going to lead us to to find this um, uh, Lebensfeld and the uh, political impact that these images had. So I was just saying that this is not enough and that we have to analyze what they really did, what, what happened in politics, what happened in political discourses, what happened in, in um, uh, population policies, what really happened. And okay, the, the, sorry, uh, the infrastructure. Again, yeah. And what was the, the first question? I forgot. Uh, no, maybe just to, uh, to explain a little bit on what actually what you're saying right now, no? what what Jose okay. Sierra really yeah. did. But maybe maybe to uh, sorry, this is my last thing for you. Uh, I think it's crucial to 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 think of mestizaje no? mm -hmm. in this uh, context. So I'm asking myself if if mestizaje is um, like to what extent mestizaje is a biological thought. Uh, no, thinking of Vasconcelos' mm -hmm. slogan, no, por mi raza hablará el espíritu, the spirit will speak for my race. Mm -hmm. So, what, like, where's the, 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 um, the jump, no, to the, to the, from the biological to the spiritual? Yeah. And to, with, to what extent it's a biological metaphor um, applied to the spiritual, political yeah. realm? Or to what extent mestizaje is already a non non purely bio, biological yeah. idea? Yeah. That's a that's an interesting question because it relates to what um, Andreas and uh, Reiner also were discussing, like the the importance of taking into account the um, mutual determination of uh, semantic fields. So it's not just biology going into the politic domain, and it's not also only the other way around, politics going to biology. It's interested, interesting to see how uh, the movement goes in both ways. And race in this case, not in all cases, for example, think about Kant's concept of race. Can concept of race, we cannot say that it's biological because biology is not a um, uh, discourse already at taking uh, existing and it's not um, making reference to genes to, well, either because genes are like in, in the 30s, but he's not making reference to an um, internal. Uh, dispositions as causes of uh, the phenotypic, such to say, uh, particularity. He's talking about climate, he's talking about uh, geographical conditions that determines all bodies. But in um, the concept of race, through the biological uh, discourse, has um, put into the concept of race um, an internal, internal dimension, like uh, internal dispositions, uh, uh, inheritance. So this is not uh, Kant's or even Hegel's conception of race. So that's an example of how race can be um, uh, found in a non-biological context and in a biological context. In the case of um, uh, Vasconcelos, uh, Vasconcelos is post-revolutionary thought. Uh, and I think 
at that time, race was already like, it has come and go from biology to politics in a lot of political moments in different parts of the world. So it is a really very charged uh, concept. Um, and it has biology in it because uh, he's talking about the mixture of races, so indigenous and Western. So he's, he's assuming already the inheritance theory. So he's thinking about the importance of uh, mixing and not what is mixed, but the result. So the causes of the mixture can be dismissed. What we are interested in is the result of that uh, mixture. So he's talking of about race, assuming a biological discussion on inerrant. So that's why I think it's biological. But it's also it can be um, improved. Exactly. Yeah, there's a there's also um, a moral judgment, uh, which is racist, of course. No. Um, well, just uh, and just to finish, Justo Sierra. Um, it's responsible for the um, educational policies during the dictat dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, and it had he has um, developed the um, elementary school programs where Spanish was the only language uh, in, in which you could learn anything. So no, the other languages could not be considered as official to teach. So that's one aspect. And the other aspect is um, his um, role in the foundation of the national university. So in the, in the policies of the elementary school, he, um, he wants to homogenize population. While in the policies implied in the creation of the national university, he wants to separate like the best um, elements of society, which are um, Western educated people, uh, not indigenous at all. So it's like an elite project, actually. So in, bo in both uh, projects, there's a very profound um, presence of the idea of race. In the one, in the, in the first one is homogenization and the other one is differentiation. But in both, race is playing an important role to determine how education must be practiced in Mexico. Thank you. Mm. What? Yeah, I have a question for, for Rainer and um, it, somehow it, 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 it's a, uh, uh, a, a nice um, bridge also because uh, I'm imposing now Mexican uh, um, political and uh, cultural uh, things to this workshop um, because there was another famous Nazi when Mas uh, uh, joined yeah, yeah. the National Socialists uh, in, the, in the 30s. No? Um, there was another famous Nazi at that time, an artist, a painter named uh, Dr. Atl, mm -hmm. um, who was the teacher of Diego Rivera and all these mur muralists. And I'm mentioning him because he liked to paint uh, volcanoes. It was like one of his <laughs> most, uh, um, like it, one of his favorite motifs. And there is. Um, a connection between fascist ideology and volcano imagery. No, there is a, like you can read the volcano as a metaphor in a very um, right-wing fascist way. No, it's the outbreak of something that was repressed for such a long time, and now the forces of masculinity and uh, cultural. Um, La raza de bronce. Yeah, okay, yeah, the, the, you know, all the potential of the repressed race finally uh, breaks out there. 
So my question or my doubt um, to to you, Rainer, is that like when you're asking um, for the, the the shift, the the, um, the theological as a metaphor um, can take uh, once the, the instability of of the of the matter is recognized. So this, I mean, the volcano is is is, is maybe such a case, you know, that there is something that apparently is you know like a dead mountain and. Maybe it's also because we, we are <laughs> sleeping here under the volcano, <laughs> growing out uh, small. So, um, so it's it's a geological thing that uh, um, sometimes appears very static, and then suddenly it uh, it does weird um, things that appear uh, uh, a living a living organism. No? But um, I'm, I'm making this connection to fascist imagery imagery to to ask you if there is not also a, a very um, a dangerous discursive potential in uh, recognizing the uh, the instability of of the geological. Yeah. Um, well, is there a, da a danger? I, I mean, I guess yes, there is a danger, but I wouldn't immediately connect uh, volcanic imagery or or even the metaphor of eruption to you know fascism um you could definitely have um the same kind of uh metaphor or like rhetorics within a left political spectrum that um might also you know have felt repressed for for a long time uh and uh you know i think also within the like radical democratic uh, literature I think I mentioned Rancière, and and he would also use um, the eruption metaphor. So, um, I, I wouldn't immediately connect this, but I mean, I get I get um, your connection that you make, um, and I do not have now like a left artistic reference with a volcano, but maybe um, uh, this is like this is less uh, less than. Uh, natural phenomenon or catastrophe but like the uh, a rift in or like a break in uh, a uh, concrete surface is very often um, you know and then like maybe there is even a flower coming out or something like this this is very often connected to like a kind of a maybe not immediately left or but some kind of emancipatory uh, imagery that is going on there that has also this um, you know um, opening of the ground kind of image going on um, and yeah recognizing instability I mean uh, this is definitely I mean I would I would agree that this is dangerous but also this is you know the danger of the danger of democracy this whole agreeing of um, instability of the institutional order that we have the fact that we can question it, and that it is open for reiteration, um, and you know that it ha it is constitutively open, and we have to keep it open. So it, I would I would probably have to ask you know like ask back like what what are the dangers of not conceptualizing the grounds as uh, possible to shift, um, and then outweigh you know both the dangers um, that both the concepts um, entail. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And before, before, sorry, before, uh, before I stop, I also had a question for Saida, just so you uh, that we don't forget. <laughs> uh, suppose you know, I'm definitely not saying that we should, for this reason, go back to to conceiving the the geological as as stable or something. I'm just you know, I'm trying to 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 measure out more grounds of, of, uh, of research. Um, yeah, uh, maybe, most... can I, what, <laughs> so, sorry. Are... Sorry, go on, go ahead. Uh, yeah, on. there is always a little bit of a lag going on. So one, one more vo volcanic uh, example that I'm thinking of now is um, the eruption of the uh, Nevado del Ruiz, I think it's called, in Colombia, 1985, um, the very same year that um, what is called hegemony and socialist strategy of Laclau and Mouffe uh, was released. And 
it is this, this is a very famous volcanic eruption in uh, the uh, Americas, uh, supposedly, because um, it, it is the Nevado de Ruiz is super close to um, Bogota, I think Bogota, and um, and uh, so when and when it erupted, there was um, like it was huge, a uh, huge uh, there was thousands of people, you know, affected, dying and, and injured and everything. And there was one um, really famous, there was a picture taken of a girl that got stuck, you know, in the debris of the volcano. And uh, and it, you know, moved around the world. It was World Press Photo uh, 1986, actually. And so this was, this, um, this was a volcanic eruption, like a natural phenomenon that, that turned really political um, for the incumbent Colombian uh, government, which at the time, if I remember correctly, was a rather conservative one. Um, so this is just like, you know, like an uh, anecdotal example of an actual shift in the grounds of a volcanic eruption that uh, like made possible the uh, a critique at a, at a rather conservative government, you know, from, from like a left kind of uh, political spectrum. Um, yeah, it was just something that I remember. Thank you. Your question to Saida. Yeah, thank you. Um, th it was really, it, I'm just, I was interested in the, the sound, like exactly when you started um, explaining this, the sound got a little bit bad. You mentioned something about an archaeology of images in the concept of, of the metaphor, something like this, and I couldn't understand it really well. Could you? like repeat and elaborate on it maybe a little bit thank you maybe we, yeah maybe we join the, the last couple of questions um florian has this question yeah uh thank you so much for both of your very interesting talks i have a question for each of you um mm -hmm. i'll start with you cider um as a passionate reader of blumenberg i very much applaud your your effort to use him politically and my uh, more general question is, um, do you think or is there, in your opinion, something that um, is political in his metaphorology in and of itself? Or why does he or his metaphorology lend itself so well to being uh, used politically, which I think it does? Mm -hmm. And my question um, for you, Rainer. Um, first of all, it's always a joy to uh, hear a Leclauian comrade. Um, and my question would be, um, you mentioned several times that um, we do not have a direct access to nature. And um, I wonder if it wouldn't be more accurate to say that the notion of something like a direct access um, or a, a thing in itself in, in the Kantian sense is already a phantasmagoric um, projection of sorts. So that to speak of a direct access or of, of nature in and of itself would be already some kind of um, 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 political intervention in a sense. So that's my, my question um, for you. Uh, Arturo, do you want to ask your... Speak Okay. Um, okay. Do you want to start right now? Because I have to talk a lot. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I, I mean, very short answer. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and uh, and since you know, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not a philosopher by. Um, my profession but you know just basically a political scientist who likes to read some theory um i must just you know trust in you of how you um, uh, retrieve this whole idea of a uh, object and uh like in and of itself and if it is already phantasmagoric from Kant, who i have never read and uh yes absolutely i mean this is probably you know like i was using the stone as an example for not being able to get a direct access to nature while the idea of getting a direct access to nature is already again an example for, for what you just said so 
Um, yeah, absolutely. I think we, uh, I agree with you and you would agree with me, maybe <laughs> here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, okay, I'm going to start with um, Rainer's um, question, archaeology of uh, the imaginary. So this is something that occurs to me, um, taking into account that Blumenberg, I'm, I'm saying this uh, on the uh, aftermath of Blumenberg. Um, and I am um, assuming a very interesting um, conception and relation that Blumenberg established between myths and metaphors. And myths are um, images. So it's an imaginary, so to say. And a metaphorology, uh, since metaphors are related in a, not in an automatic way, but in a way, um, to, to myths, um, I assume that metaphorology is also a search for like a ground zero of, um, like a source of images that, um, make conceptual uh, thought unstable, talking about the geological uh, metaphors, right? Um, that's what I meant, actually. Just to, just uh, uh, metaphorology as a method, my, my, my interest is to discover how metaphorology can be really a method, not just to mention Blumenberg because it sounds okay, but really try to see what met metaphorology can do when we uh, make this kind of, of research. And uh, I think uh, these are methodological hints to his um, 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 metaphorology, so uh, hints to his philosophy uh, to understand the methodological value of this uh, uh, proposal. No, no, so propuesta philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I don't know if it's uh, enough. It's not developed at all. I have to, it's a work in progress and I have to write a lot. Um, on this. And um, the second question Florian um, Kathy asked, uh, yes, this is a subject that interests me a lot because um, I read and read the paradigms, but I don't find any political uh, metaphor being analyzed. Uh, and that's uh, not only my impression, it's also an impression I forgot my, the book I was reading on it, um, an impression of an, an author I am reading, um, why we are uh, insisting in using uh, uh, metaphorology to analyze political discourse when Blumenberg himself was very um, discreet in every sense and in political sense as well, in, in the political realm as well. Uh, and he hints to a passage in the metaphorology that I assume can be an answer to to that to your question, which is also my question. And I'm going to to read it. It has to do with um, the practical force I was referring to earlier. So Blumenberg states that uh, not only language. Uh, things before us, this is a very romantic um, um, thesis. So not only language thinks before us and is, so to say, behind our vision of the word. Furthermore, um, we are determined coercively, he uses this word, um, by the selection of images, they channel that 
what we call in general, what we in general cannot show and um, experiment. Um, so yeah, this is a key passage for me uh, that reveals to which extent we can talk about metaphors in a political sense because they are coercive forces and practical forces um, determining attitudes in the everyday world. This being said, I recognize that um, I need to find other ways to uh, connect uh, this statement with my actual use of Blumenberg's method in the political discourse. I know it's not enough to say that it's just course and course, um, but I haven't counted it. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm working on it, on it and I, um, I have to say that this is also a very important question for me. Okay, I think we have to yeah. continue um, to hurry up a bit and uh, welcome Lauren. So if you are ready, we're going to now hear Lauren Markovitz talk, the domestication of human animals, and then we'll follow it by uh, another round of discussion. Lauren, bitte. Hello, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Unfortunately, I haven't had time to really participate uh, so much in the workshop since I was traveling between continents and also just arrived here in Vienna a uh, couple of hours, uh, about an hour ago and just arrived from the airport. So, uh, I, But I was very curious about your debates and I'm going to read your abstracts more, more precisely now. And uh, yeah, so anyway, I'm going to present some thoughts about the, the domestication of human animals. And I, I hope this will provoke a couple of questions. And I'm really curious of what you're going to say about this, also this work in progress. Um, on October 9th, Israel's Minister of Defense, Yoav Galant, announced the complete siege of the Gaza Strip and declared, we are fighting human animals and we are acting accordingly. Israel's war against Hamas was thereby framed from its very beginning with a dehumanizing language that prefigured Israel's subsequent transformation of the Gaza Strip in to stay in this metaphorological background, slaughterhouse. The statement also implies that the war is part of civilizational efforts aimed at domesticating what is wild uncultivated, uncivilized, or even at domesticating what appears to be unproductive, inefficient, or outside a perverted consensus of what it means to be human, be it humanistic, Eurocentric, or capitalist. Following the metaphor, so in a way taking it seriously, the war efforts can be interpreted as domestication as the domestication of human animals aimed to convert free individuals into docile subjects whose life and death are reduced to the service of those who domesticate them. In, a, in addition, the metaphor human animals frames the perception and cognition of radical otherness, and we have been speaking about that in the yesterday too. These are the other which appear very familiar and very strange at the same time. Familiar as the experience of emphasizing with the emotion of a befriended pet and strange as the inability to completely understand what this pet might say or think. For this reason, the coincidence of obscurity and familiarity expressed in animal metaphors and animals appear to be very suited for thinking about the extremes of our existence, about the things we fear and label monstrous, and about, about the things that we aspire and idealize. Just thinking about, uh, well, a lion can be very terrorizing, but at the same time, it is also an image of strength and power. 
Um, as the anthropologist and ethnologist Claude Lévi-Strauss succinctly notes, natural species and particularly uh, are particularly important for representing the abstract, not because they are good to eat, but because they are good to think. Animals in totemism cease to be solely feared, admired, envied. Their perceptible reality permits the embodiment of ideas and relation conceived to be speculative thought on the basis of empirical observations. So this is just uh, some notes on the relevance of totemism for metaphorology and in a way how it is placed into animal metaphors. Following Levi-Strauss, animals are, from a metaphorological point of view, perfect candidates for all kinds of metaphorizations. Animals are used to describe and circumscribe uh, people as docile herbivores or aggressive predators, as submissive dogs, patient oxen, busy bees, sly foxes, royal lions, cruel wolves, dirty pigs or parasitic rats. This just to mention a few, and uh, I'm thinking that probably each culture has their own images of metaphors of, of uh, animals, and probably you, you from a Mexican point of view could contribute there, uh, a couple of other metaphors. And yeah, we in the German speaking world, we are speaking about these things. But the boundaries between the living and the dead are negotiated by referring to animal stereotypes. As metaphors and figures of thoughts, animals frame arguments by substituting the unknown and abstract with the familiar and the concrete. To employ an animal metaphor, metaphors tame uncertainties like humans tame wild animals. So we see also here maybe we can see how this language of animal metaphors has a really rich uh, background that encompasses a lot of our language, also about our language of uh, how we can think language. And to return to the initial metaphor, calling Hamas terrorists human animals helps to understand their cruelty by putting it, it in some more familiar framework and thereby pacifying the shock and terror instilled by the terrorist attack. Yet, despite the condolences offered by the metaphor, the discrimination of people along the demarcation between humans and animals is frightening. The discrimination along the lines of animal metaphors can be compared with the way populist discourses refer to the people as a collective subject contested by corrupt elites or also criminal migrants. Um, when describing the difficulty to grasp the paradoxical relationships between oneself and others, Julia Kristeva argues that the reflection of oneself in the in the other shapes both, one's desires and one's fears. In Tales of Love, she argues, love appears as an area of freedom because it accepts the protagonist's dissimilarity and even their conflict, in the same way as it aims for the identification of the one with the image of the other. Of man as an animal centered in the precedence of its needs, with an ideality that nevertheless deified because it is assumed to be accessible." Unquote. The imagination of the other in the image of the animal determines not only the, our perceptions and our actions, animal metaphors provide very concrete and tangible aesthetics to the abstraction and complexity of desires and fears. Animal metaphors also rely on conventions. The wild animal eludes, the, eludes the domestication and is threatened at the same time with extermination. So we see it here that there is also some ambiguity about these animals all the time. Also, the pet belongs to the house. It is private and it is the property of the master and the mistress. So even though we might think of the pet as something very nice and uh, docile, at the same time, thinking about pets implies some kind of a patriarchal connotation. The farm animal also 
is a commodity and a resource that might be exploited. Chris Deva argues that images of the animalistic and monstrous are bred and cultivated, along with this retinue of idealizations and mysteries and the strained motion of condensation of contradictions or paradox paradoxical signifiers. The fantasies surrounding human-animal relations influence the way humans define themselves, who they are, what they want and how they act. When animals are excluded with reason from the mass of the people, the very same reason is used in analogy to exclude others whose existence or actions resemble animals by being savage, by being irrational, by having no conscience, consciousness or also no conscience. Rosie Braidotti argues in this regard, subjectivity is equated with consciousness universal rationality and self-regulating ethical behavior, whereas otherness is defined as its negative and spec specular as a counterpart. Insofar as difference spells inferiority, it requires both essentialist and lethal connotations for people who get branded as others. These are sexualized, racialized, and naturalized others who are reduced to the less than human status of disposable bodies. Braidotti writes in The Posthuman. So what are we as philosophers and metaphorologists supposed to do with this, these dehumanizing statements, like the statement uh, quoted above? Should terrorists be treated as less than human as human animals and be acted on accordingly? One approach appears to be to question the metaphor by trying to define terms more exactly, images, connotations involved to spell them out. Another approach could be to follow the metaphor by taking it seriously and with uh, a gist of irony, trying to interfere with their more problematic sides. And I will try to do both and just an, in a little attempt, uh, attempt to, to, to try to tackle these both sides of taking it seriously and of dissecting this metaphor. So first, what can be said about the metaphor of the human animal in terms of definitions? Well, humans are animals and more precisely mammals in a biological sense. Speaking about human animals implies that humans and animals are fundamentally different. The metaphor implies a fundamental limit and difference. It demarcates the, a categorical shift and it creates a new category and hierarchy between the category of the human and the animal. Are the terms animal, human, human animal, Biological terms or cultural and political terms, can they be used as exact scientific definitions for differing forms of organic life and therefore part of a biological categorization of species, similar to the ones developed already by Carl Linné in the 18th century? And what, in what way are they different from plants and bacteria, passive vegetables, or dirty deliverers of disease. Just to mention also, here's Susan Sontag's work on, on uh, the metaphor of disease and disease as where bacteria also play into this metaphorological horizon. So uh, famously, Michel Foucault quotes in the order of things that uh, the... China, uh, a certain Chinese encyclopedia, as it is uh, said, by George Louis Borges. Uh, animals are divided into belonging to the emperor, embalmed, tame, sucking pigs, sirens, fabulous animals, stray dogs, included in the present classification, frenzied, innumerable, drawn with a very fine camel hair brush, etc., having just broken the water pitcher that from a long way of look like flies. 
So he, this is just this classification, and probably you all uh, have know it. So this the, the oddity of this classification, uh, Foucault says, is the paradoxical and unusual ju juxtaposition of these cate categories of general and idiosyncratic categories, of the sudden vicinity of political, agricultural, mythological, as well as subjective perspectives. And this emphasizes the mere act of enumeration that has a, has a power of enchantment, and that all ordered surfaces and all the planes with which we are accustomed to tame the wild profusion of existing things are related to the contingency of distinguishing between the same and the other, a contingency that disturbs and threatens the accustomed order of things and which demonstrates that the boundary that separates the same and the other is never guaranteed but the product of political negotiation. So introducing uh, the new category of the human animal between the more human and the less animal is also an, uh, an interference in this more familiar categor categories where we just distinguish between humans and animals or human animals and non-human animals. The recorded history is full of examples of discrimination along the line between the human and the animal. So in place of many other instances, uh, I want to note how Enlightenment philosopher Francis Bacon argued for the support of colonization, expropriation and exploitation uh, in a book called, titled An, Adv An Advertisement Touching Unholy War from 1622. He writes, the native people of the Americans, Americas are swarms, routes and shoals of wild and savage people like beasts and birds. And in this way, these discriminations um, provided a theory of genocide, as Marcus Reddick and Peter Linnebaugh argue in the history of the revolutionary Atlantic. So yet, um, let's uh, try to tackle this issue from another side. Animal metaphors are more than images of the abject, dirty and terrorizing other. Since the beginning of the human civilizations, animals have been partners and close allies in the process of cultivation and domestication. Animals serve humans as suppliers of meat, skin, bones, and other materials, as draft animals and for other labor-intense tasks, as experts for searching and guarding, as companions, and even as testing animals for biomedical research. So, in a way, if we owe that many skills and that many things to animals, why are we, we do we have this metaphorological horizon of thinking animals as dirty, as abject, as non-human? We go to the zoo or to the circus with excitement and awe to see ourselves in the animal and to see how much we resemble their shape or movement. We go on farm home holidays to escape our industrialized urbanity. We work in slaughterhouses to earn a minute allowance under miserable working conditions. So our lives are also in, a, in our very post-industrial civilization still very much entangled with animals. The process of civilization appears to be facilitated by interspecies cooperation and not by human curiosity and ambition alone. In an interdisciplinary investigation of domestication, um, titled Documenting Domestication, Bringing Together Plants, Animals, Archaeology and Genetics, domestication is described as a syner synergistic, synergistic process and the coming together of a plant or animal population with a human population in an increasing interdependent mutualism. Now, so the significance of animals for human survival, well-being and development has been declining. We have also been thinking about the, like uh, meat produced in laboratories and so this might not be involve animals anymore for meat production. And animals remain a central 
reference point for defining humanity. Animals relate human existence to their living environment. They mirror their or or organic constitutions, their instinctual actions, and their emotional intelligence. Also, machines have replaced animal labor in many cases. Dogs are still trained for war and pigs search truffles. And in many less developed regions of the world, horse-drawn carts and oxen-driven plows have not been substituted by electric or fuel-powered engines. The imagination of oneself and one's community in the image of an animal provides a strong source for positive identification. Recognizing the value of animals, humans as animals or human animals, is essential for understanding who we are and also how we react in the case of a terrorist attack, bombardment or lingering low intensity war. This distinction between animals and humans is charged with metaphysical meanings. It generates feelings, tells stories, and it is itself an actor. The place and manner in which a boundary is drawn between animals and humans also conditions the relationships between the foreign and the own, the other and the same, as well as between nature and culture, civilization and barbarism. On this border, we negotiate the bestiality of humanity and the humanity of the beast. So one possible route that sabotages the forms of dehumanization uh, aroused by and incited by this metaphor of human animals is not to oppose the statements, but by changing the value and implicit normative connotations community, communicated by identifying the other as animalistic. If animals are not regarded as irrational, savage, or violent, but as intelligent, civilizational, and compassionate, the attempted discrimination fails. It even runs contrary to the intended offense and celebrates the other as resourceful and irreplaceable. So I could stop here uh, if I have more time, but well. I can't hear you. I think, um, yeah, we are uh, approaching the end of the workshop, and maybe if it's okay with you, we would uh, like to have a discussion, or do you want to say some final? Yeah, uh, I suggest say, say my final. So my final relation also to this uh, initial uh, context of where this metaphor was first uh, uttered. Um, so. In a comparable where referring to Palestinians as human animals is not dehumanizing, but highlighting the importance for Israel. It demonstrates that their workforce force provides cheap labor to the Israeli economy. And it highlights that their otherness provides the imagination of the national unity of Israel with a very concrete negative fantasy. So it's the usefulness of human animals for the purported humans in that sense. While addressing other humans as human animals is dehumanizing for those addressed, it appears to be reassuring for those utilizing the metaphor. Those who assert their moral, technological, and even evolutionary superiority by referring to others as animals. Calling Hamas or Palestinian people, and in, in, in general, and this differentiation appears to be very blurred, and sometimes uh, it is blurred so much that it has become an identification. Human animals, this metaphor of human animals, is dehumanizing. And it is also stabilizing the identity of Israel and repairing the sovereignty of Israel's government, which has been put into crisis by the terrorist attacks. So, in a way, I could say... The metaphor of human animals is an epistemological instrument in as much as it shows how much Israel depends on Palestine. And it is a political weapon that grants authority to a sovereign put into crisis. So thank you, and I'm very curious about your questions. Thank you.
I would like to uh, start with a question. That's okay, <laughs> but maybe we gather some so we can then uh, yeah. have a common uh, discussion. <laughs> and also, if it's okay for everyone, we can uh, maybe agree to to take some 15 minutes more because we started later. Yeah, sure. uh, so it would be nice if you guys could hang on a little bit more. So now, um, uh, okay, I have a, a quite uh yeah several questions comments to yours first of all um the i totally agree that the, the difference between uh palestinians and hamas in the discord is blurred but mostly i see uh, that it is blurred by um defenders of Palestine against and somehow genocidal uh, politics uh, on the side of Israel. So I think Yaab Galant, whom you quoted, did not refer to Palestinians as human animals, but to Hamas as human animals. And I think that's uh, it's very, very important to, to stick to this distinction and also to look at the uh, uh, discourse of Israeli politicians, even though uh, you might, and I'm also not a big fan uh, Galant, um, uh, that uh, they, they uh, normally refer to Hamas, and not, not to uh, every, any, like every Palestinian, uh, with these kind of statements. So um, I fully agree that the, the distinction of humans and animals is already um, an actor here um, uh, in this conflict. And I, I, but I'm, I also want to insist to read this statement, a very problematic murder statement the Afghanistan made, um, already in, uh, in the context of the discord, and a very important, um, important uh, element of this discourse was said two days before uh, Joab Galan made his statement. So the acts that were committed on 7th of October, I think, uh, by Hamas terrorists, I think, have to be read already as part of the discourse. Um, and I think it's very important to read, and we also learned that in, in, in Mexico with narco violence, to read violent acts as a language. And what the acts that are committed um, try to understand what they are trying to, uh, to communicate. So um, this is very difficult and uh, emotional um, so I'm, 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 I really have to, uh, to try to be to be to formulate it in a sober way so what I'm asking myself is how we as philosophers and metaphorologists would read um, the act of torturing a pregnant woman cutting out her embryo and then burning both bodies alive and setting them next to the kitchen table of the parents of the woman in question. So it's, I'm asking myself is that this is um, uh, the only one uh, case of uh, um, almost thousand um, violent acts that were committed that day by Hamas. Um, so I think there is definitely, like if we read this act as metaphors or as discursive elements, um, there is, uh, of course, the discourse of dehumanization set there. Um, I'm, I'm really, myself, I'm not sure like how to, how to read it, like if the, the, the message of dehumanization, like it's definitely, definitely directed against uh, the Jewish population is not uh, even be because you wouldn't do that to an animal. Um, so it's like uh, 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 communicating the Jewish population is worth less than animal life or worth le like there is no uh, um, rules at all anymore um, in this um, othering of uh, of the what Hamas considers their enemies. Um, but there is also a self. Uh, um, performance, like a performance of uh, like uh, an identity that's displayed there as um, something. I mean, animal is not. It's, it's probably not the the, the right uh, uh, metaphor here. But there is some kind of monstrosity, bestiality performed there. Um, um, that's also like displayed on social network, like it's, there's a wish, a desire to be, like to, 
to perform this uh, monstrosity in a, in a, in a, on, a, on a really mediatic, uh, broad uh, level and to broadcast this, um, this absolute break with any, uh, any respect for life, be it human, animal, or uh, whatever. So, so I think uh, we could criticize now Galant and uh, Israeli politicians to somehow, you know, um, um, react discursively, like, like to, to, to enter this discourse in a way, even though I think to say human animals, uh, it, it, it's, not, it, it's not even um, connecting to this discourse that was set by, by Hamas. But, um, but I think it's important if we talk about, uh, about this conflict and, and about um, how we think of, of Hamas, which is not at all the same as thinking of Palestine, thinking of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, it, it's very important to read Hamas's uh, discourse, also metaphorologically. So this is my comment to you. Um, um, yes. Uh, so let's collect here, Saida and Abdul. Yeah, two things, Lauren, thank you. Uh, maybe I'm going to take up on what Steffi was commenting. Uh, just an analogy between uh, this uh, statement and uh, Trump's uh, statement concerning uh, migrants, Mexican migrants in the United States. He uh, called them whole rapers and crazy, bunch of crazy people. I don't remember if he stated that Mexican migrants were animals, but he could have said that as well. And this, I think, had to do with, uh, with Trump's um, strange, to say the least, way of communicating, uh, but also with this, uh, the social uh, and political and economical situation in Mexico, um, deriving in narco violence, as uh, Steffi was mentioning as well. And it is a very, um, it is an important question to ask ourselves why we are um, uh, making a recourse to this uh, metaphor to um, point to a violent um, uh, behavior. It's not any, or it's not a random uh, violent behavior. It's a behavior that takes the, the victims of this behavior out of the cultural and social realm. So as uh, Hamas uh, attacks, uh, Stricky was referring to, in um, uh, narco-violence, uh, this is one of its characteristics of taking the subjects of the violence completely out of the, so to say, spiritual realm. And uh, it could be like a tool to think about this kind of violence and, and to um, discuss the metaphor uh, in this uh, context which is not the same context. That's why I like to insist on the uh, semantic fields, which are also historical. So this is one realm, and this is a very important and urgent uh, realm to talk uh, about. And there's another realm, uh, which you have also referred, which is the historical way that we have um, um, the historical, the way that we have historically uh, used this uh, relationship between animals and, and humans. This um, uh, metaphor of humans as animal, human animals, which is, um, I don't know if the, I'm, I'm reproducing um, correctly what, what you say. But in this other realm, the realm of the historical analysis of this uh, uh, metaphor, 
uh, I, I just wanted to say uh, something that doesn't have anything to do with what I said before. It has to do with one thing you make me think about, and I think you mentioned Donna Haraway's uh, text, uh, and there is an important text, at least uh, a text I, I like a lot, and you, maybe you, you referred to it, I don't, I'm not sure, the, uh, the Companion Species Manifesto, where she is dealing with this difference uh, and how we are understanding this difference. And I like her point a lot because she's, in her explanation, she's uh, mixing biology, genetics, and culture. And it's amazing how she explained how animals are humanized and humans are animalized, not just because of practical, sorry, because of cultural practices, but also indeed. So we are like um, from within animalized and animals are from within humanized because the activities animals have, have performed uh, living with us have modified um, uh, the uh, uh, to the level of inheritance, so to say. And we too have changed uh, in a biological sense because of our um, contact with other species. So I think that's a very um, rich field uh, into which we can also analyze this, this metaphor. And again, these two fields uh, are very different and it is also important as uh, uh, Blumenberg lesson, I would uh, say that it is important to really depict the, the semantic field where a metaphor is used. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Lowen. Yes. Um, <clears throat> no, I will leave it there. Um, I have some questions since uh, the presentations of uh, Zaida and the Vaina. So um, they are of a very general scope. So maybe maybe we will, uh, we're all somehow interested in them. So I will allow myself to make very broad questions. I I, I must confess first of all that I'm not expert in Blumenberg nor in meteorology. But uh, some ideas came to my mind, especially yesterday when you were talking about Derrida. And my, my first question is, how are we, we use the word uh, uh, metaphors in several, in several senses. So my question is if metaphorology is not as impossible as a grammatology, because we were talking about the problem of defining or not being able to define uh, metaphors because it seems like everything is a metaphor. And if we cannot distinguish between what is a metaphor and what is not, there is no metaphorology strict to sense a uh, sensu, but some uh, consciousness about the metaphoricity of language in general, and 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 I I I I wanted to bring uh, Derrida to the discussion table because that's more or less his stance. There is no grammatology as such. Grammatology tends to uh, destroy itself, and it seems to me that the concept of uh, or the idea of a metaphor tends to destroy itself because it destroys the distinction that grounds the concept of a metaphor, which is that there are proper senses and metaphoric senses or direct uh, connection between things and lateral or different connections uh, among things. That's that's my first concern. And it's really more a concern than, 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 than a question. Then uh, jumping now to, uh, to uh, Saida's Saida's presentation, I, I found especially interesting the idea that, well, two ideas. First of all, that uh, concepts that are political is force, but the other thing that's yes, important, even, even more important, is the fact that politics 
is not in the set of metaphors, but in the application of metaphors. So some uh, some words try to clarify this. Uh, let's get Kantian. <laughs> no, no, we we tend to, we tend to use, and it seems to me that there is also, and this is just an impression. There is also in Blumenberg um, this idea of the a prioricity of, uh, of of metaphors. So it seemed to me clear that there is some uh, distinction between the a priori and the a posteriori. That means that there is a problem not of only of the concepts, such as we have categories in Kant, but there is another problem, which is that of application. Mm -hmm. So um, Cesar was, uh, was asking, how do we relate metaphorology with critical ideology? Because critical ideology needs some distinction between what is proper and what is being used or what is given another juice that is meant. Uh, so maybe, maybe ideology and the political uh, dimension of metaphors lies in application because you can, you can make a metaphor, you can, I don't know, of whatever thing, but uh, the political is what is being true in that uh, in that metaphor, and what is being, what is false or what is instrumentalized in the metaphor. This is the, this is another way of putting uh, the Lacanian or psychoanalytic distinction between uh, the subject of negotiation and the subject of the statement. That is, you can make two things at the same time with metaphors. You can explain something and blur another at the same time. You can say something true, but be unfair or unjust. So metaphors are not simple. They can do good and bad, so to speak, at the same time. So if, if there is something like a metaphorology, it should include the moment of application and all the fields in which such a metaphor is uh, having effects. Uh, why? Because, and, and, and this is, and Kant has a word for this. So maybe a metaphorology would demand some schematism or schematism, because that's the problem of application. We have a set of concepts, or maybe we have a set of metaphors, but they do not produce effects directly, but they have, it's not just we have language, and then we have uh, specific uh, uh, language in general, and then we have languages like English, Spanish, French, German, and then we have uh, I know that we in, in, I, I forgot the word in English, but uh, it's uh, in French's language. Uh, I know they, that's, that's, speech. Speech. Thank you. Thank you. That's speech. And it's not the same. So maybe to conclude uh, this, this part, sorry. Metaphorology needs uh, schematism as the moment of application. And uh, because that's the moment in which you make something readable in terms of something else. The, but, but you have to prepare the ground to make metaphors applicable. So these processes of schematization are, seems to me, uh, of fundamental importance. Uh, now, uh, uh, now very concrete. Now I promise concrete, uh, concrete questions. Um, Can you try to be brief because we have yes, to catch uh, up? Sorry, I can't. No, I will. Now let's let's leave let, let let's leave it like like this. Just what about thinking not only of metaphors in general, but types of metaphor, layers of metaphors? Because sometimes it's not it's not only what about the, the metaphors we have at our disposal, but the sets of metaphors that constitute the space. Because politically, you don't have to be consistent with some metaphor. You jump 
from different sections of, 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 uh, of metaphors. And sometimes it's very important to distinguish which, which one is our variant or a beast and which one is a human. But at another layer, it's important to see what type of animal are you. If you are noble, like the eagles, or if you are vermin, like, like, like Donald Trump has said, uh, from it, from his enemies, or it, it's not saying being a rabbit or being a fox or being a bacteria. So maybe at another level, it matters not being an animal, but what animal are you? But thank you, and I'm, I'm very sorry. But <laughs> go on. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I think uh, wait, let's get. Yeah, yeah. let's uh, hear loud and, and also please go and try to be brief because we don't. Okay, so um, well, I start with you, Steffi, uh, if that's okay, and then uh, Saida and 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 you. Uh, so uh, yeah, so the first thing, the blurring. Well, uh, we probably all know that when we use a more floral language, blurring is more uh, likely than if we use a more concise language. It doesn't mean that we can just eradicate all metaphorical connotations but the moment we are we are more poetic it is also implying the danger of being misunderstood so well absolutely i'm on your side to say well it's very clear that galant meant uh hamas and not the palestinian people but uh at the, uh, a consequence of using this more metaphorical uh, language is also that there is a more, uh, this, this blurring is more likely. And then it's out of our hands, really, what is going to happen with this language that we once placed into the discourse. So there is always how, like, the context. And I think it's very interesting what you said about uh, the the this kind of cannibalist uh spectacle that you mentioned so it's really how how i'm politics is a spectacle politics is a theater and certainly terrorists are uh all about that their effect rather than instilling some real control about people it's about the terror it's about the theater it's about what are we going to to do uh with our actions, what emotions are we going to produce? Are we effectively uh, are is terror effectively evoked, or how is this terror being pacified? And I, I try to say, like using this terminology of taming and pacifying, I think uh, this metaphor of the human animal was very successful in pacifying that terror that was evoked by successfully demarcating, okay, this terror is not coming from something within, but some from something outside. And this, in that sense, I think it was uh, in a way very clever also to use that metaphor. Um, yeah, and the cannibalism, again, it is also part of a self-description. It is not just something that is coming from the outside. You are a cannibal, you are barbarous. You are this cannibalistic um, um, discourse comes out of a long tradition where it's also uh, about uh, incorporating the powers of the enemy, enemy by eating them. I just want to point to uh, Oswaldo de Andrade's uh, Manifesto Anthropophago, which is important, which might be an important reference here. Um, yeah, and surely we probably cannot never really, uh, separate this, this, uh, these comments from its context. So context is really important. And also what one, one context is probably the, the more physical context, uh, of the political and physical uh, um, events that are happening and on the other context that, that I want to emphasize is all this and maybe this is connecting also to the, the other questions that there is always when we are speaking about animals that it is a very rich metaphoral metaphorical field that animals since they are so close to uh, uh, our existence from, from the beginning of language probably 
uh, that animals are really part of our language everywhere and we can find these animals animal uh, connotations and connotations of life with animals everywhere in our language uh I, at least i suspect that i can you know but it's i suspect that we can find this animal uh connects some uh, like in many 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 relations not just in the relations between the self and the other or in, in the relation of violence or nobility but also in in more um more physical economic terms probably too um yeah and um yeah the spectacle of violence as you pointed out uh, sana it's uh, that was very that is really successfully also utilized by uh, by uh, persons like trump who are not just who are really very successful in using a spectacle even though it might be uh, in the first place uh, against their own uh, political intention, intention, but by spectacularizing uh, events, it plays into the hands of uh, a more blurred language, where it's uh, a language of um, uh, them against us, and where these more uh, subtle differences are uh, erased. Um, yeah, and yeah, I didn't mention uh, Donna Haraway. Uh, directly but she certainly uh, stands behind my my I ideas here also uh, i want to mention james scott who uh, who wrote a book uh, of about agriculture and uh, the state and yeah I, I think one one important hint might be uh, that he provides us that this whole discourse about domestication is not just the domestication of the other but which also results in a domestication of ourselves. Um, and uh, yeah, this discourse about the organic and the spiritual, I think uh, it is important also to mention that uh, this, this statement about human animals, it is really referring to, well, these are not machines. These are not uh, robots who are uh, instilling violence. These are organic uh, agents. And well, this it 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 in in a way it's a very deliberate choice also to say well this is not similar to a holocaust that was done in the industrialized way, but this is the violence of individuals which are organic and which have blood in their bone in their cells and so on. So it's also really to say human animals is also a choice to say okay we are using this metaphorological uh background and not the other one we are not choosing to say well this is an enemy that is uh that can be administrated uh and it's just about uh, finding enough data and then somehow uh the right algorithm and we can calculate uh uh uh, uh some results that might be uh okay with us so we can put that results then again in an equation that we say, okay, yeah, it's uh, uh, that many hostages, so we are going to uh, kill that many people and there is it can be a rational equation. So this is not going to happen. So it's it's really not this me mechanical rationalist discourse, but more discourse about uh, humans and animals and uh, the violence of emotion that uh, is present here. And um, yeah, so uh, thank you for your comments also on, on this more general topic of metaphorolo metaphorology. And yeah, I, I think I, I tried to do this. So really to well, one side was try to, to think, well, how can we somehow tame the metaphor? How can we uh, get rid of some of its more... Um, um, dangerous sides in a way by defining it by finding okay what can we how can we define it what are human animals human animals are between humans and uh, and animals it's something that we can maybe 
be more specific about. And so this might be a strategy that as uh, philosophers, we might be able to approach to say, okay, we want to be more specific. We want to have a specific language, even though we know we can never be super specific, but we can try to be on, on a spectrum. We can become a little bit more specific in our language. And, um, and the other side was, all right, no, I don't want to be specific. I really want to uh, follow that metaphor. I want to go into that uh, metaphor. And what does it mean to be human animals and really taking it seriously and then uh, thinking, well, what what are the consequences of thinking Palestinian people or like in that sense, not Hamas, but the Palestinian people as human in animals. And this leads to them saying, well, okay, yeah, there is a form of domestication going on. And we might think, well, this might not be the first thought, but if we are taking this metaphor seriously, then we can also think about uh, these war efforts as a effort of domesticating that is also following some economic agenda. Um, yeah. So maybe if you want to have some other questions or if, if there is time. I think, I think we don't have time anymore. We have to... Yeah, we have to, uh, we're already almost half an hour over time. So thank you very much, Laun, and uh, thanks everyone who's still hanging on in Austria for uh, participating. And I think it was a very successful yes. event. And uh, hopefully there will be uh, more more of, of them. Yeah. See something. Thank you very much. Good night over there. For and attending at this hour. Thank you, especially Lauren, that you just come from the airport to to participate. Thank you very much, Dorian and Heine. And Arturo Cesar also, thank you very much for everything. Oh, it's Goodbye. So nice. Thank you to everybody and it's a great event. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.